Thank you, everyone, for showing up this morning. And thank you so much, Renda, and thank you, Ad Hoc, for putting together this panel and inviting everybody. It's a privilege and an honor to be here uh, and to talk about a subject that is so important. It used to be our local subject, but now it is a global subject, which is reforming uh, Islamic thought. So in my talk, I'm going to uh, try to address four questions. One is, what are the obstacles to reforming Islamic thought? And number two is, how do we deal with attacks uh, in the Muslim world, uh, blasphemy laws and outside attacks of Islamophobia, for example, anytime somebody wants to address this question. And I will also talk about how the American administration deals with this issue. And finally, what can we do to address this phenomenal problem of reforming Islamic thought? Mohamed, is on entend bien au fond de la salle? Mohamed, on entend bien au fond de la salle quand elle parle? C'est excellent? Okay. I will start with talking about the challenges to reforming Islamic thought. Truly, the greatest challenge is these blasphemy laws. So it's not whether Islam can be reformed or not, it's what are the obstacles, and the biggest obstacle by far is these laws. Because any time an intellectual attempts to address the grievances and the, the clash between what used to be okay and what is, cannot be part of the modern world, these intellectuals are silenced in the name of blasphemy laws. So you might have heard of Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid. He's an Egyptian intellectual who wanted to wed modernity to Islam, who wanted religious institutions to, to play a more constructive role and he was deemed an apostate for that attempt. And he had to flee Egypt uh, to save his life. And that is unacceptable for an intellectual who's Muslim, a practicing Muslim. But this is how limiting these beliefs are. But this practice goes back, actually, for hundreds of years. Early in the 20th century, there was another scholar who was, who was actually um, al Azhar. So, these blasphemy laws, not even intellectuals within Al-Azhar, not even religious authorities are safe from. This scholar is Ali Abdul Razak. And what Ali Abdul Razak wrote is a book called Islam and the Foundations of Rule, in which he, he basically argued that we don't want a caliphate, that a caliphate is not a system that is conducive to prosperity or human rights. This is coming again from a judge at Al-Azhar the equivalent of the Vatican for the Sunni world. And yet he was fired from his position. He was never allowed to hold another position all his life because of this argument. So how, if, if the people whose bread and butter is to produce a thought that can take us to the next phase in, in evolution, if these people are silenced through these laws, how are we as a culture can move forward? And it's no longer just our problem, it has become a global problem because this stagnation is spilling over all, the entire world. It's destabilizing not only the Middle East, but also Europe is seeing the effect of this. Uh, so this is the first obstacle. The second is, and this is perhaps why the religious institutions refuse to have this debate, is that there are a lot of sacred texts that are really difficult to read differently. There's a lot of direct texts that are, you know, sanctioning rape, sanctioning killing, beheadings, cutting heads and hands and beating women, and this is directly from the Quran. So how do you, how do you deal with something like this? You can say, this is a challenge that a lot of even these intellectuals face, is that you argue, for example, that uh, Islam is 100% compatible with human rights as we have arrived at them in the 21st century, but in fact, your argument is not backed by sacred text, whereas when ISIS makes an argument, they have a lot of sacred text. But just because the text exists, does that mean we have to do what's in the text? But it does make it harder, because you can't as effortlessly quote verses that are 
completely conducive to 21st century human rights, which again, humanity arrived at after much trial and error. error. So, so this is a, a second one. The third is really a cultural uh, problem. Uh, so I am from a Muslim community, so I'm gonna speak about my community, if I may, and of course, every single one of us is a, is, is a spokesman for their own experience, so I do not by any chance represent the entire Muslim community. There is as many Muslim communities as there are maybe Muslim people, which is a lot. So, but there's quite a bit of insensitivity to, viol to violence internally in the culture, which again, it's spilling over. So to give an example, if you have things that are legal, like honor crimes, that is a culture that says it's okay for you to kill your daughter or your sister because she has a heart and she fell in love. How outrageous, how unacceptable, and you can kill her. That is a lot of violence. Or that you can force your children, your, your daughters, to, to wear a scarf when she doesn't want to. So I actually was one of these people that was forced to wear it, and it was Really, every single day, my dream was to take off that piece of slavery for me because I, I didn't choose it. And I interview, I'm writing a book actually right now to, to basically introduce the world to the people in the Arab world that are presenting solutions to our challenges from within using the internet, social media. And I meet a lot of young women who are doing a great role and Many are still wearing the scarf even though they hate it. That is an act of violence. So how do we as a culture really become sensitive to violence internally against among each other before we are sensitive to it externally from the other? So we have an overinflated sensitivity what the other does to us, but not so much internally, and that is an imbalance. So how do we tackle this cultural issue? And the challenge is that the producers of, of culture are silenced also because of these blasphemy laws. It's very easy to silence anybody uh, in the name of insulting Islam. That can, it's very broad, it's not specific. And this is tied to the next reason, which is authoritarianism. So authoritarianism and it plays a really big role because they silence producers of culture. You know, when, when Jamal Abdel Nasser came to power, the first thing he did is fire uh, whom he saw as Western-influenced professors like Taha Hussein, the father of uh, culture in Egypt, and stopped the translation schools and closed many theaters. And so that, that uh, strangling of culture has an effect on us. Culture is, is a venue to, to really work at sensitivity. And authoritarian, is, authoritarian figures and terrorists understand the power of culture, which is why they do not allow it. ISIS or any extremist would never allow you to have theater and dance and movies and stories and because it's an expression of sensitivity and it dignifies your individual humanity, and that, that goes against extremism and authoritarianism. So another obstacle actually is Islamophobia, and I'm talking about real Islamophobia. There are unprecedented attacks against Muslims in, in, in America as of this year. So that makes it really hard to talk about anything related to internal debate, because the lines are really blurred. So there's so much sensitivity anymore that if you just quote something that happened, an, a, a historic incident, and it happened, and it's documented in the Quran and in all the heritage, and, and it, but it's not a very flattering incident, then right away you're accused of Islamophobia. So this actually dishonors the real people who, who, who face attack, like in Kansas, there was a militia that planted a, a bomb in a mosque recently. So when we use that term lightly against anybody who wants to have an internal debate, we really dishonor those who are really threatened, but also contribute to the problem. Because unless we have a debate, unless we push the envelope, how are we to move forward? What makes Europe different is the ideas, is the thinkers like Voltaire and Spinoza, and we're not allowed to have these in the name of these in, in the name of insulting Islam. Um, so this is 
I, I'm happy to elaborate on any of these reasons, but this just gives you an idea. So how does the, how do we, how do we, um, I want to talk about the administration in the U.S. Since I work in the U.S., I worked in the policy uh, world, first at RAND and now at New America. So, you know, the, any American administration, most likely, I mean, Trump is the exception perhaps, does not want to be controversial. Does not, it, it doesn't see that it's its place to go talk and mediate between Muslims or to tell them. So, of course, they would rather be out of this debate and just you know, say what is respectful, what is honorable, what is, because it doesn't feel like it's, it's, uh, it's place to tell people what is Islamic, what is not, what is, although it has to some extent. But that said, there's undeniable sympathy towards Islamists that I have felt personally in my entire tenure of being an analyst in Washington is that I am constantly accused of being not authentic enough because I'm not an Islamist. So there is, somebody has decided that if you're from the region, and it doesn't matter, like I come from the biggest tribe in Jordan, my tribe goes back to the time of the pharaohs, if you're ever in the British Museum, the burials of Bani Hassan are still there, but that doesn't make me authentic because I'm not religious. I'm not Islamist, not just not religious, I'm not Islamist. So I've had this accusation, and it's really irritating. Who has decided that unless I'm an Islamist, I'm not an authentic voice from the Middle East. Who has ripped me off my right to be, a, I mean, it's not even a right, it's just a fact. It's like telling Americans, unless you're Christian, you're not American, or unless you were uh, white, you're not American. It's very insulting. But the West, and, and, and especially in America, it's really, they're not aware of this insensitivity. Um, and we have to fight this because this sympathy is really costing the entire world because there's a huge imbalance in siding with Islamists as authentic. And Islamist, political Islamist uh, parties have proven over and over that they are very authoritarian. And there's enough of us in the Middle East that are really sick and tired of authoritarianism. We would like to see real human rights. We'd like to see real engagement. We want to play a role in, in building our countries. And we're excluded from, from that engagement. And Islamists, like authoritarian regimes, exclude everybody who's not, who doesn't uh, carry their vision. It's not even a vision, they're, they're narrow-minded ideology. So this really needs to be tackled. And how we tackle it is that we continue to speak up about this issue. And the more violence, you see extremism ex being exacerbated in the last, it's worse every single year because, we, because there's denial in the connection between blasphemy laws, between this imbalance in, in speaking only to a certain voice from the region. And this is causing the problem to really become worse and worse every year. So what can we do about it? So number one is to really do what ad hoc and Randa is doing, is to continue to push for this issue and continue to put it in the agenda. Because it's, it's no longer an internal debate that we can't be in the middle of among Muslim communities. It's a global, it's a global concern. And people need to be able to contribute to Islamic thought, need to be able to challenge a lot of the taboo issues, and even to be non-Muslim. This is their innate right. We have to push for secularism because secularism is the right for everybody to believe whatever they want. It is not the right to not be religious only. It is the right for Sunnis to be Sunnis, for Shia to be Shia, for whatever shade and color of faith people want. This is what secularism is. And we have to educate about it. Another thing is to to lobby governments in the West, and that all of us that live abroad, a lot of us lift our countries because we don't feel free in our countries. We can't contribute, we can't think, we can't, so we leave. So a lot of the best brains are actually outside the Middle East, and that is a treasure that the West needs to cultivate. They've cultivated Islamist voices, actually, in places like England. I remember reading Bin Laden faxes from England. So they've allowed Islamists to have quite the space to grow quite healthy, and we're all seeing the result uh, of this, uh, the sectarianism, the violent sectarianism. And they need to really now invest in the secularist 
healthy uh, intellectuals and people who really want to see liberal democracies in the Arab world because it, it serves the entire world for, for the Arab world to be healthy, for the Middle East to be healthy. And we need to lobby governments. Governments are essentially people, so we need to really talk to them and present our case and, and, and really face that, that lie that secularists are not authentic enough. Um, also, philanthropists and wealthy people have a really big role to play. You know, we are in Italy, and the Medicini family played a huge role in giving birth to the Renaissance in Italy. We have a lot of wealth in our region, but how many of our wealthy people invest in actually producing secularist culture? A culture that allows for a different voice, for a pluralistic voice. So we need to, again, make a conscious uh, move towards pressuring our wealthy people to invest in the stability of our region. And um, we, have, we have an unprecedented opportunity in our hands, which is social media and the internet. And again, if I may mention my, my book again, I meet young people all over the Arab world who have impacted millions of their peers using social media, using the internet. So how can we further use this resource to to really push for secularism. And I say secularism because, again, it's the freedom for everybody to believe. And secularism and these blasphemy laws cannot exist in the same, you either have light or dark, you can't have both in the same spot. And I'll stop here and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a I have a question. I have a question for you. I was quite interested when you spoke about uh, Nasser, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and you said that everybody knows that Gamal Abdel Nasser was not uh, very interested in religion. We all remember his press conference where he makes fun of uh, ladies having a scarf. We all remember that. You can see it on YouTube. So, how do you? Can you explain us why Nasser, when he came to power in 1953, or the revolution in 52, but he came to power after Negib, uh, why he fires all this, as you said, healthy professors, you use the word healthy, why is there some kind of instrumentalization of Islamic thought by Nasser, though he was not a devout Muslim, can you just explain that to us? Uh, this is really related to authoritarianism. Authoritarianism and freedom of thought cannot exist in the same space. And Nasser understood this, that he cannot have... Egypt was producing so much culture to the rest of the Arabic-speaking world. It has such a thriving intellectual ambience and that and authoritarianism cannot exist in the same place. So if he wanted to have control over the country in the way he wants, he had to limit freedom of thought. And Nasser nationalized Al-Azhar. So in 1962, Al-Azhar is the equivalent. It's, it's the foremost uh, um, reputable institution of Sunni learning in the, in the Muslim world one can argue. And uh, he brought the religious institution under the government wing. So it lost its independence, it lost its, uh, and it became essentially a mouthpiece for the regime. So this is a very interesting because it's a, it's a thought of how secular government, authoritarian government can actually feed as Nadia told us, feed um, intolerance and Islamism. This is quite interesting. I mean, uh, how, um, I mean, for me, it's quite interesting to see how authoritarian regime can feed within themselves. Uh, and it was, we had that also in, of course, in Iraq, in Libya, even in Syria, uh, we had that. Because in Syria, you saw that, you know, uh, when Hafez al-Assad came to power, I mean, there were very few students in Damascus 
wearing scarves. Um, now they all, all, most of them uh, are wearing uh, scarves. Okay, thank you very much.